I'm here having a gas with Tony Hoffer, the excellent producer and engineer and mixer and sound designer and all of the things. The picture I'm starting to get, the more producers I talk to, is that it's a lot more of an individual life than people expect. And there's a lot more responsibility on your shoulders than people would would, would assume. So is, is, that, is that right? Is it basically you and whoever else you can afford to sort of help you out? Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, I, I actually love the business side of it. I do like, you know, the working out the deals. That's actually quite fun for me. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of music people, a lot of producers, mixers, engineers, artists, they don't really like talking about deals or money or terms or whatever. And um, I've always kind of enjoyed that. You know, it's it's kind of fun. Um, so some people don't want to, you know, they'd like, well, we can talk to your manager. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I mean, why don't you and I, we'll just, it'll be much quicker if you and I work out the thing, the, the you know, the nuts and bolts, and then I'll just hand it over to my management and they'll kind of execute everything. But yeah, um, but yeah, I kind of like that, you know, roll up the sleeves and, and, um, figure out, you know, cause it, it helps figure out what, what they really, what they need and how, you know, how I can help them and how we can figure out how to make something work. And it's, I don't know, it's fun. It's also quite liberating, I think, isn't it? It means that you're not subordinate to someone else to figure out how you how you make your money and how you put food on the table. There's an element of, um, to use a modern word, empowerment that comes from doing your own deals. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I've I've always been very hands on with everything, um, but but you know, managers are great. They can be they can be really helpful, and it's you know when when you get to a point when you, when you have something to manage, they, then you really, you need a manager. You'll, yeah, and yeah. you'll know it when you get there. Um, you'll, yeah. you'll know because there's not enough hours in the day to actually get both things done. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you're having to chase, um, follow up with people about projects, you know, to get a project, if you're having to chase, you know, when, when is the money going to come in the front end payment for something or did a contract get, signed or what, you know, is this a con contract coming over all this kind of, I mean, to me, it's kind of that part of it's sort of boring that I'll hand over, but the deal, the negotiating that I like, you know, that's, yeah. fine. but you know, I couldn't do it. I, you know, I couldn't do that full time. I have to do, I have to be doing something creative, but, um, but I, in some ways I, I feel like the business part of it is actually very creative because there's a lot of different types of deals you can do and you know, how you, how you structure things. So, so in a way, I guess it is quite creative when it gets to be chasing people, following up for the ninth time, dealing with the universal portal or whatever, anything like that, you know, to, to, for payment, I'm, I'm not, that, that's where I kind of zone out on that. I'm going like, to bring up a, a name that's going to come up a couple of times in this podcast, which is the, um, the, 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 the wonderful Steve Albini, who, uh, said, um, I prefer working with independent labels because generally they pay you on time. Major labels are horrific at paying you on time. And that's because not, not, we're not slighting major labels. They've given uh, us a lot of good records. But the bigger the company, the longer that they can stretch out like payment terms and things like that. So maybe that's what he's referring to. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I just find there's so many people involved in, in a payment at a, at a major label you know, on the email, the, there could easily be seven or eight people. Um, I think there's just way too, it's overcomplicated. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're so big and there's just, there's so many people and, and there's multiple departments that need to approve things. And then people are out of, you know, they leave for, to go on holiday or whatever. So it's, it's, uh, I don't, I don't know if there's maliciousness in it, to intentionally slow things down. There could be, I don't know. Um, you know, definitely in contracts, there's things with majors and indies to, to um, you know, protect their investment and slow the payment of royalties to producers and mixers and right and artists and all of that. But um, I wouldn't say that's malicious. It's, it's their, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough business. I do actually get what you mean because when I was um, not, I mean, five years ago, probably 
I started to notice, you know, as you kind of graduate from one world into another, and you've been through this as well, you know, you were in a band and, you know, Beck was supporting you at one point. And then, you know, you go into studio work and then you become a producer and suddenly your kind of perspective on everything starts to shift and you see it from the other side. And I noticed that all the artists I knew were basically saying, uh, why do, um, you know, labels, why do major labels take so much of the money? And I'm like, because they're doing so much work to make you famous. They're doing marketing, distribution, they're doing sales, you know, it's like all that stuff costs money. And so I, I just start, I started to relax my kind of, the big businesses are evil approach to everything. It, it definitely takes money to break an artist. It, it takes money. Um, and, and, and that's the deal. You know, if you go with a major label, um, which could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. There's, there, you know, there's many projects that I worked on where the artists did well on a major label. And there's other projects I worked on where they probably should have been on a smaller label and maybe built things up a little bit more from where they were at before going to the major. And maybe that would have been a better trajectory for them. But um, it's, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of capital to break an artist and, and luck. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it, I, I don't have a thing like, oh, oh major labels suck or, or whatever. I think, I think they can be great if they're used right. It's sort yeah. of a tool in a way, you know, like you would, an artist would, would perhaps sign with a major over an indie or self-release in different circumstances. You know, what, there's a, they're all different tools depending on what you're needing to do, what you're wanting to do, where you're at. And, um, yeah, yeah. It's kind of how I look at it. It's, um, when I was, you know, when I was 18, 19 years old, um, and I was in my, you know, my first band and I used to think, I used to perceive major labels and also this was 2011. So still, I don't know what it's like in the States, but I, if, if it still felt like in 2011, radio was the way that you got exposure because we were just on the cusp of this streaming and social thing taking over. Um, and I used to basically perceive major labels as banks that would give you money to become famous and yeah. radio stations, if they, if all they did, if, if radio stations just played your music, you would become famous. And then I was like, um, all of those people, well, certainly the labels, are taking a lot of risk on your on, on your behalf. And, you know, you mentioned a moment ago, it takes takes capital, it takes money to break an artist. That's the reality. We all like the dream that you write, she loves you, or I want to hold your hand. And then everyone thinks you're the best. But what, what do you, I mean, this, I'm not going to ask you a contrived question, I apologize. But, you know, if you had to ballpark it for a young artist, what kind of thing, what kind of capital are we saying it takes to invest into an artist to break them? I guess it depends on how far along they are, mm. you know, how big do, do they have a fan base to release music into? Is there some base already established? Um, if there's not, I would actually say it should take that. Like, you shouldn't spend any money probably or very little. You don't know if there's a market yet. Yeah. You should probably, I mean, the, the, the amazing thing is with, with social media, an artist back compared to when, when I was in a band, you know, mm. a few years back, um, where our social media was literally handing out flyers on the corner, you know, um, we would go down. Like 1991, 92 kind of thing. In there. Yeah. Maybe a little bit before <laughs> then, but yeah. And, and, you know, a little before and, and after that, but yeah, in okay. that, in that zone. Um, and so pre-internet basically. Yeah. And, that was it. You know, you've got, you know, we would literally go down to where people that liked music were at. So for us, it was in, in LA, it was, it was around the sunset strip back when there were, you know, a lot, it was a lot, there were a lot of people there to check out new bands at the different clubs. And, you know, it was, it was cool back then, kind of on the, be the beginning of maybe not being cool. Um, but we would go, uh, and we would hand out flyers, especially if we were going to be playing around there. We would just go on a corner on like a Friday night or Saturday night and just here, come check out our band, come check our band. And we would try to make engaging flyers to hopefully catch someone's eye. We'd also put them up. 
um, which they'd usually get taken down by the end of the night. By you know, someone would take them down. But that was our social media, and you could only hit so many people, and we had to pay to, you know, get the design. Usually, one of one of us would make the design. The drummer would make the design, but you have to pay to get them printed, um, et cetera, et cetera. With social media, it doesn't cost anything. You can literally promote to people globally from your phone. And so it, it kind of levels the playing field in some ways. Yeah. So if I put a bit of pressure on that as well, though, yeah. which is to say that that's an enviable situation you're in. You're in the Sunset Strip and there's an audience who are there for exactly the kind of person you are. You're an unsigned band, you're unknown, and they're trying to see who the next big thing is because some people like live for that moment. I got there first. And then in the social media world, um, yes, the original idea was, well, you can hypothetically promote to everyone. But of course, that kind of targeted promotion, I want music fans in LA who like this kind of stuff, all of a sudden, you actually have to pay big tech giants to push your stuff to that audience. So, but I don't know. Well, maybe that's a bit too cynical. But yeah, not not necessarily. I mean, you can, but if you have content that is clever and engaging, then it, it, it will make its way out, you know? The, the real mm. question is how long will it take? Is it gonna take right. a month, two months, six months, a year, six years? How long is that that gonna take? So if, it, if it's engaging enough, um, you know, there's, there's many artists that I've worked with that have started um, with some social media following and then they, they were very clever with their, you know, I hate to say, you know, but, but their branding and just mm. the, what, what they were putting out and the frequency of it. And they, you know, they would quadruple in a year, they would quadruple or, you know, double that quadruple and, you know, they would just, it would keep expanding. Yeah. So it's, um, they're, they're, it's possible the label could be paying for, um, for ads to, to, if there's a single out, they, they could be paying to get that, um, in front of more people to bring in, to expand the fan base. But from my experience, from what I've seen, it's, it's hard to do, it's hard to get big numbers on that, you know, and that's where you have to start unless you're spending a lot of money to do that. Yes. I mean, do do you know our homegrown local flavor, the 1975? Uh, I think I've heard of them, yes. Yeah, so they're probably the biggest band, I would say, to come out of the UK in the last 10 years. Four-piece, you know, a, a, yeah. a unit of people playing instruments. We know sure. what a band is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I heard on the grapevine, so caveat, this will likely be inaccurate, but not unimaginable, that they had to spend about £100,000 to break them into the mainstream. So that is entirely possible. Um I, I was actually following their trajectory. They had, they had, they were, I believe they were called something different actually before the 1975. Yeah, they had, they had about three names. I was a mega fan, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> big yeah. sleep and drive like I do. Yeah, but so it's possible 100k. I mean, I would actually think to break an artist at that level for if we're talking break like first album, chocolate, you know, all, all those songs that were coming out, I actually would have thought it would have been more than that. Right. um, Because when you're talking radio to, you know, in the, in the U S to run a radio campaign, that's what it would cost for, for one song, I would say for, for alternative, we have a format here called alternative and um, which is probably what they would have slotted into at that time. Um, And it, it really takes like, 80 to 100 and, you know, and up 80 K to 120, you know, to, to do it right, to get like a, a, a number one or a top five, mm-hmm. it costs a lot of money. And oh. so that's why you were saying, I suppose it's like that. So, so there's mm-hmm. a potential and that kind of people will, people will be in despair at those kind of numbers. Where am I going to find 150 grand to break into the radio? And it's like, well, that's why you need someone with the kind of capital reserves of a major label who can spend that as long as there's a potential to return that investment. And they're more likely to be confident the investment will be returned if you've already got this little homegrown fan base. It's like a sample of the population. Some people like us. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, you know, and I, and I wonder like with the 1975, it probably would have been a different, who knows, you know, if they were to come out today in 2023, um, they probably would have used social media more. It probably would have been a lot, you know, very heavy on TikTok and, and that sort of thing. But artists, it, it happens all the time. There, there are a lot of artists that are doing things that are on social media. They're building up a following. People are just interested in, in what they're doing. They're doing something that's clever. People like it. More people will go to it. These artists are actually getting signed. Whether the music is good or bad, I, I don't know. But, um, but it's, it's, it's what's happening. And um, so in some ways, it's cool. It levels the playing field. For, for a lot of people. And if you can do something that, that is really unique and, and, and this, you know, as we, we've been talking a lot about like kind of the business stuff, but you know, on the, to the production side, what I always look for forever, you know, since I've been doing this is music that's, that has a sonic identity to it. That like the 1975, you could say they definitely have a sonic identity. It's very clear what it is. And, um, Good singer has a good voice, you know. Um, they're making music; it's culturally relevant. It's very, it sounds very fresh, and it's it's cool. I'm very um, sorry, Tony. We lost you just at the start of the description. You said what I go for is, and then we went into a radio tunnel, and then uh, the artist. Is, and so, what are you okay. looking for? Sorry, I said the most amazing thing right in that little bit there. Um, basically, so so what I as a producer, what I look for is. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I saw that coming, Tony. <laughs> um, what I look for is music with, with you know, a sonic identity. And so, like, so let's. I mean, just for as a reference point for a track you've produced, talk about that. What was that in Naive by the Kooks? It's you know, what's that reference point? Well, so for the, I, I would just looking at them as speaking generally from that era of for, or the. the collectively the songs from that first album inside in inside out like that would be because i'd be looking at well what songs are we going to do you know i'd be looking at the whatever 10 or 12 songs that we had so as a when they played they they had something that was very just different yeah it was four guys bass drums a couple guitars a sing you know heard it a million times but there was something there was definitely a chemistry and a um a sound that culminated you had you know there the what what contributed to their sonic identity was that you had the drummer paul who um was very much into stuart copeland the and you know the police the drummer from the police and you could hear that from the side stick work you know you could hear from the side stick work yeah and i think you know i, I don't know if i mentioned it in in that thing I did with mixed with the masters. But when I, when I went in the room for the first, I, I always do pre-production with, yep. with artists. Like if it's a, if it's an artist where there's a chemistry like that, I definitely want to get in a room with them and just see how they all play together, how the songs work with them playing them and together. Um, but when I walked in there, I saw Paul had like, um, you know, he had a massive drum kit. Mm-hmm. He had a timbali on the left, left side of the hi hat. He had um, a little sp- couple splash cymbals scattered around. He had um, a china type cymbal. Um, do you know what that is? Yeah, china type has a very like trashy sound, doesn't yeah. it? It's relatively short and it's concave. Yeah. Is yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've mentioned it to some people, and they're like, I, I don't know what that is. Because a lot, of, not a lot of people use them. Because they were kind of, yeah. they they kind of fell out of fashion. They were huge in the '80s. You had to have one. Every kid playing drums in the '80s and early '90s, you know, you go through that phase where you've got like twenty-two piece drum kit kind of thing. Most Post of them, Maiden and Rush. Yeah, so you would have a China type in there. So I hadn't seen one in a while, and for me, I was a little snobbish about it as well. I was like, oh no, we don't do the China type. So I walked in, and. Um, and I'm trying to think. He may have had, he may have had um, three or four toms, you know, like two, two or three rack toms, and a floor tom. Yep. Um, yep. Which was a bit unusual. I was used to a rack and a floor, 
you know, kick yeah, snare. Yeah, the, 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 the punk rock setup, the Charlie Watts, the traditional, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I walked in like, okay, well, that's going to go, that's going to go, that's going to go, without hearing a single note, you know, just me seeing that, my observation. And, um, but then they started playing and Paul, you know, these, these are essentially kind of rock songs. Luke, the singer, was really into, you know, Bob Dylan. Um, what was that other artist? Um, kind of an indie folk artist uh, that it'll, it'll come to me. Um, but, you know, a lot of cool kind of si- the Stones, a lot of cool 60s stuff, um, classic, classic writing. The bass player, Max Rafferty, was really into James Brown and yeah. Relic and um and hugh was into a lot of the similar stuff that luke was into a lot of cool 60s stuff and also they were into current stuff as well you know modern music yep. but um Hugh also you know he was into like african music he had he had done like a summer workshop learning how to play high you know high life music on guitar and you can hear that in his playing so all these little things that they're into i mean i guess this is what makes up a band this is what makes mm-hmm. bands cool but this was part of their sonic identity um you got one guy doing the police you got another guy doing dylan another guy doing kind of like this you know african stuff and then you got p-funk on the bass and it was it is just what it was so oh and the other thing they had three they three of them well really all four of them sang but um i heard them do some harmonies in the rehearsal room like man these three-part harmonies are insane they sound really cool we anywhere that we can drop those in we need to do three-part harmony on any bit so like throughout that 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 first album and i think you know probably the the other two that i did i did three total um inside in inside out conk and junk of the heart um we we that probably waned a bit um but definitely on the first album we did a lot of that three-part harmony so that was that was the sonic identity and the goal was to make a culturally relevant album at the time that you know felt like people would like and you know most importantly that we liked me the artist um but you know obviously we want to make something that you know could hopefully hopefully people would get into and you know ex- ex- hopefully expand their fan base and all that you remind me on the sonic identity as uh, trying to you've got a distinct sonic identity and what you described there was a band assembled from distinct parts the kooks i would not have <laughs> I would not have said any of those influences that you mentioned, but once you said them, I did not, it made, but it makes sense. So, you know, the name of the bass player again was Max, Max, Max when, when you said Max is into like funk stuff and you listen to the record in your head and you're like, yeah, obviously you can hear it in the influence, you know, uh, you can hear Copeland uh, in the drums on the side sticks and the very high hatty, like choppy stuff. Um, it reminds me of when Rick, uh, Rick Rubin in McCartney 321, he said, um, when the Beatles do reggae, it doesn't sound like reggae, it sounds like the Beatles. And then a genius uh, edit point, they cut to Obladi Oblada. And you're like, oh my God, I never noticed that's supposed yeah. to be reggae. <laughs> so that's what you mentioned, right? Sonic identity exists, but you can't just leave it there shapeless. You have to kind of get it into the current moment. Yeah. I mean, all of those influencers, influences are filtered through the individual members and then kind of um, combined with the four together. And then I come in and I'll amplify certain things. I'll see like, okay, let's do, you know, let's bring more of this out or more of that. Let's push this back. Um, So it's just kind of figuring out the the bending and the shaping of things to get it. A bit bit less Dylan and a bit more Copeland here. And then, yeah. 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 You know. Um, so that's really cool. And for channeling my channeling Steve Albini again, who one time in, in 27, I wanted to do this podcast for a long time and we only started it in 2019 because COVID allowed us to. But I tried a couple of false starts in about 2017 and I recorded a, a podcast audio only with Steve Albini that I never released and basically kind of argued about recording formats for an hour. And um, the... <laughs> part the part of his philosophy that made a lot of sense to me was that uh, his recording philosophy in the track you know in tracking um, 
was that he would let the artist perform the way that they performed and would fit the mics around that performance and fit you know he he would he would let them go in the room that feels right to them and play it the way that feels right and he would you know he said he wouldn't start turning amplifiers down and or removing things from the drum kit he would see that's probably anathema and um you know i noticed you saying in mix of the masters you know um a good snare sound doesn't always equate to a good side stick sound. So you have a separate snare just for the side stick. And so what, where do you stand on that particular debate on, you know, shape, on, on shaping the artist to suit the recording or shaping the recording to suit the artist? You know, um, I get the sense that the latter is not appropriate if you want to break into commercial territory. They're, they're all, um, this is what's so cool about recording music and producing music, mixing music, there's, there's hundreds of ways of essentially doing any one thing. And there's hundreds of ways, maybe foul, I don't know, you know, but there, there are many ways of recording an artist. And, um, if we're, if we're going to stick to, let's say four people in a room kind of thing. Um, yeah, like the way that, that Albini does it like that, having lots of mics around, um, it's cool. It's a, it's a, they're all kind of tools or methods, you know, and they're all right used in the right situations. So that I've done that. And, and it's great. You know, when you've got something and you're trying to have like kind of a, a somewhat literal, um, present uh, representation of what happened out there, trying to capture that, um, that, that could be great. Um, I, I have always, you know, I mean, from the beginning, I don't, I don't do a lot of literal type recording, but the majority of my stuff, it's, it's all kind of hyped and enhanced. So, um, I'm kind of thinking just more so the, the artist is playing this way. How can I enhance that? I don't really, I usually don't actually for the most part, you now there, there's been some things that I've done where I'm going, I want it to be very, a very honest recording and mm -hmm. not hypes. But for the most part, I'm wanting to hype stuff and have stuff be hyper real and um, get into hyper reality, which is something I learned about many, many years ago when I was doing sound design for, um, you know, video games, museum installations, commercials, that sort of thing. Um, but you get into this sort of hyper reality world, which is yes. really cool. It's like in movies a lot, you know, um, when like in a, if, a, if it's like a football movie, the, the guy gets the, the quarterback gets the ball and then he's looking, everything goes into slow motion. All, the audience, the crowd goes away. You just hear his heartbeat and breathing. Mm -hmm. and, and then he throws, ball goes in the air the person who catches it, catches it and then, and then it goes to the crowd. But that whole thing, the, that's hyper reality of like getting rid of all the, the sound, the, 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 you know, the, the, the crowd and just hearing the heartbeat and the breathing. That's hyper reality. Um, sweat dripping where it makes a sound like you, you know, these are not, it's not reality. That's so right. but with, with music recording. So I kind of brought that into production where um, I want stuff to be, hyper real to, so it jumps out of the speakers, even when they're really quiet. And, um, so I'm, I'm usually thinking more like that. Mm. Um, but I love other ways as well. There's, there's other projects that I've done where we're, you know, I'm not wanting to hype anything. I want it to be, um, a very dynamic recording where things are quiet and they get louder, you know? rather than everything just in your face and, and whatever. But, um, but yeah, it's all good. It's, it's like, what does the song want? You know, I think the songs kind of tell you what they want and they'll tell you if they want a lot of production done to them. And they'll tell you if they want, like, just keep it simple, you know, don't, don't overdo it. Cause it's going to distract from the lyrics or from something that the singer is doing or, or the character of whatever it's going to kind of dilute that. So you have to I feel like the song tells you what it wants usually, you know, so I'm always, I'm listening to the, to the song. 
Yeah. Yeah. Duh. What, but yeah. And what, yeah. <laughs> what happens in those moments where there is a disagreement between what uh, you as a as an experienced producer and as an experienced manipulator of sound believe that we should do to the you know the tracks and the drum recording to get that hyper reality to get it to do what it needs and the artist uh is more of a mind of no no i kind of like it how it is i've i've done everything the way it should be and with the you know we're now fully immersed in the age of everyone can have their own digital audio workstation and everyone can kind of feel like a producer at some level what do, do you have those moments do they come up and how do you get past them if so sure yeah it's a negotiation kind of going mm. back to the business Thing. And I love, I love that, you know, um, if they're adamant, it's gotta be, I mean, look, if they're adamant, something needs to be a certain way, th then cool. I'm not going to bend an artist's arm backwards about whether we're adding a tambourine on some, whatever, you know what I mean? Like if it's some, if it's some trivial thing, I'm like, good, we're good. Let's move on. I'd rather not, to be honest, I'd rather not take the time to even have the conversation. If they're adamant, yeah. there, there's some battles that are, are definitely worth fighting. And if it's something, depending, if it's something that's, I feel like, okay, cool. It's a total subjective thing, a total taste thing. They want it this way. Good. I'm good. Let's go. Now, if it's something where um, a more bigger picture thing, if it's some minutia thing, I'm often flexible with it. And, um, you know, if it's a big picture thing, I might be, and they're adamant, like, no, we really want it this way. We've had it this way for a long time, and this is how we, we really want it. I'm like, good. You know, I'll agree. It's probably a good way. Like, we've been living with it for a while. Like, there is probably something good about it, for sure. But could we take a half hour and maybe explore some other possibilities? Um, I would hate to... Um, you know, there could be an opportunity for something really good here, but I'm not sure you, you know, we might need to take a minute to figure it out. And if it doesn't work, we're good with the other way. You know what I'm saying? Usually people are going to be okay with that. Rarely will they say, no, I don't want to try that. Like that would be un highly unusual. They'll be mm -hmm. like, sure. You know, and sometimes Sometimes the artist is, I mean, often the artist is right, you know, they're, they, you know, they, it's their song. They, they know quite a bit about it. Now I might be having, I might be bringing something where we could um, really expand on something and, and make it even a, a whatever, more, more awesome. Um, and, and it's possible I'm right, but we'll have to try it. And usually people, you know, they're working with me because they want to try things. That's, that's why they hired me in the first place to experiment. And I, and I do like to experiment. So that would be a good thing to experiment with. But if it's a little, if it's a trivial thing, I, I'm usually pretty easygoing. Um, cause I also feel like we can circle back on things as well. You know, you can kind of pace things to where, yes, let's put in this guitar um, now, if it's something that's like a real busy part that it's a, and it's a little bit of a wacky idea, I'll be straight up. I, I'll, I'll just say, look, the part's super cool. There's already so much going on with the song that I, I'd rather, like something's going to have to give. Like we have to, we can do this part, but then this other thing's got to move out of the way or something. Like we've got to cut it out for there or find a way to get everything to work. Because, yep. uh, you know, the reality is I am trying to arrange things in a certain way where things, you know, stack up and fit fit together. I can't fit them all together, but, you know, they things, the sandwich stacks up nicely. I mean, you've said before, haven't you, you're kind of mixing on the fly when you're recording. You know the frequency elements that where, yeah. they, where they're going to go. You, if you, you, know, you're, you know when you're setting up the mics that, uh, I don't know, this snare is not going to have a lot of bottom end because I need all that space for something else. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Con even in pre-production, when I'm in a rehearsal room, I'm kind of figuring out how things are going to fit together, how they're going to stack up. I'm kind of mixing it in a way in the rehearsal room um, yes. and definitely in pr production, like throughout the production part of it, for sure. You know, I'm trying to 
get a good sense of how is this all going to work, you know, rather than adding all these low end elements. And then deciding later. Electric bass, synth bass. Fender Rhodes. Sub bass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like they all can, that can all work. It's just the, 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 the sonics have to be designed properly to where they are not just obliterating each other. And I can, you know, I can sort that out in mixing, but I'd rather be committing that. Like, let's just get that, you know, when we're tracking it because it makes the mixing. Yeah. There is, there's a, some people I've worked with, um, and this is sort of an older style of recording where they would literally set all the faders on the desk at zero. So that you know, they're up at zero. At, all at the faders are up. There's no signal going into them yet. Correct. Okay. Um, when, so this is, these are the returns, you know, so mm -hmm. you keep everything at zero. You set your levels on the pre's to where faders are at zero. So you're kind of doing your balance as it's going to tape or to, to, to disc or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when you um, go back to mix, you put all your faders at zero and that's, that's where you head everything. You're, you know, that's your starting point. That's your, your good balance rather than, you know, the, another way is just getting all of your levels. So they're really good on tape and then your faders are going to be all like this. But if you have everything at zero, you kind of have a good starting point to your, um, to your song. And then you can just kind of push things up or down a little bit. But you can kind of get back to that point really easily at any studio. By just resetting to zero. Resetting everything up at zero, yeah. Up exactly. Zero, yeah. 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 So that's, that reminds me of when I started watching Al Schmidt's Mix of the Masters and um, Al's, uh, uh, the, the balance just sounded perfect before they even did anything. And I was like, this already sounds mixed to me. Like, what's going on? And obviously it's because, I mean, Al was, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, I believe. And Al was a, a like a pretty old school guy. I mean, you can even see from the fact that he's working at whatever it is, the mix room at Capitol Records. And, you know, the assistant does, is, is, is not doing a, Pro Tool session, he's labeling a desk with a marker pen. And um, anyway, that's all non sequitur to say. I imagine that's because the way it will be done in the previous era is the way you're describing where, you know, the balance is pretty good coming in if it's been recorded well. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so people like us who had to, who we, us late millennials who have learned on the fly by having easy access to loads of like software and stuff are just going like in this chaotic, like ev every, all these samples are super hench and or they're all at zero dB. And yeah, it's quite a, quite a chaotic, quite a chaotic way of learning. I, I would like to probe you a little bit for the fact that you started out in the same industry that we're currently in here at Gas Music as a sound designer, not started out exactly, but you've had a career as a sound designer and a sound effects editor and mixer for commercials. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I started out at, you know, as a musician and, and then I, you know, the, the next logical step was be, you know, do the band thing, um, which I loved. And then, you know, we, we took a little, we took a hiatus, which, which I suppose we're still on. And, um, and then I wanted to work in studios, you know, I wanted, I wanted to do, I didn't know I, that I wanted to do production. I didn't even really know much like what a producer did. I wasn't really thinking like that. I was just thinking I wanted to make, um, I wanted to have a career doing something with music and, but not so much touring, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to join, um, another band although I ended up doing a little bit of touring with Beck um, uh, uh, in the late 90s. Um, but I didn't want to do a, my own band, go out in the van and just go around and around the country. That, that Live sort without of, a shower uh, for a week at a time and things yeah, like that. Yeah. Mm. So, um, and I always loved the studio. So I ended up getting a, a, a job at a studio in, in San Francisco where I was living at the time. And, um, yeah, I kind of, that, that's what was needed there. And so I got into more like of the sound design stuff and, um, and it was, it was really helpful. You know, it was, it was kind of a cool, it was, it was kind of a cool way to get into, um, learning about recording and 
getting music, bringing drama into music, in, into when I started working with artists, bringing, having drama in those songs, you know, so having choruses sound really exciting, having an intro sound very mysterious and atmospheric and setting up a, a vibe, you know, setting up a um, kind of a, yeah, an, an atmosphere basically um, of what's to come. And, and I think a lot of that helped me with the, that sort of that little era of sound design that I was doing. And um, yeah. So. And would, it, would, the, would the work come into you or were you quite aware of the context, you know, the kind of clients you were talking to? I mean, I know that Goodby Silverstein, I think, are a San Francisco agency. So my guess is you did some work for them. How did it work? Like, what was, the, what was, the, what was it like working in that side of things? So I was, I was basically a staff engineer at, at the studio and, and yeah, there, there was a lot of, um, there was someone there who was a, um, well-known, uh, composer for commercials and, and sound. And so you do com composition and sound design. And so I was one of the, the juniors that would, help with that that would basically so he would he would you know almost always do the music and then he would mm -hmm. bring you know me or you know some other people in to do the sound design for for these commercials but it was like you know stuff you know for hewlett packard got milk um sega um you know um a lot you know a lot of like corporate stuff mazda porsche um and, and the, you know, from the, a sound design perspective, the stuff, it has to sound cool. Like it has to make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. It has to be intriguing in 15 seconds or 30 seconds or, or whatever, you know? And um, plus those schedules, you know, it's super fast turnaround and super chaotic you, you just have hours or just a couple of days to, to do a lot of stuff so you learn to work really fast and, yeah. and that that was um very helpful so when when the time when i was ready to start working with with artists and i was still doing my own music at this time and and really you know my heart was really in music like that's like making songs and and recording songs that that's that's really where um, I'm that, that's where I'm best, you know, yeah. I feel. And, um, I still thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll make music and maybe I'll get signed as a solo artist, you know? And then so one thing led to another. And then next thing, you know, I'm like producing albums and mixing albums and, you know, with artists. And I left the sound design thing behind. What happened in that, in that, in that chasm? How did you get from that to the other thing? Um, well, I mean, I was, I was making music, my own music and, um, and, you know, and recording other people as well, you know, recording drums in in unusual ways. I didn't really have a lot to work with. I had one stereo mic and so that's, I was recording kind of everything with that. It was a, v, a Shure VP88 and, um, which it was just the mic that I bought. I was using it for like field recording and, you know, for capture, for sound design, because it was the intention of, you know, why I bought it. But I'm like, oh, yeah, it sounds cool. If you point it at a drum kit in front of a drum kit, it actually sounds like, like really good, like well, -recorded, drum kit. well recorded drums. Yeah, like, this is amazing. So, um, so I started using that and, um, and I was making my own music. And the, the bass player in my old band um, Justin Meldel Johnson was playing bass with Beck at the time. And, um, and he's like, man, I should, I'll play Beck some of this stuff. It sounds really cool. And he's like crazy, you know, this one of these songs, it was like a, a crazy, super fast bossa nova song I did. Um, and I had like maybe five samplers or so that I was using at the time, at least five. Um, and it was just super fast, super gritty, a lot of weird filtering stuff going on. It was really, it was cool, you know? Um, so, you know, Beck heard some of that stuff and then it was like, hey, would, you know, would, do you want to come down to LA? 
for maybe a day and just try some stuff out. So that's, so I'm like, yeah, I'll be right down. So I went down, we, I brought a crate of records with me. Um, and the first day we found something from this artist called Boney M. Um, and we uh, basically got something going, built up a song. He's like, hey, can you come back tomorrow? I'll do, I'll got to write the lyrics and we'll do the vocals tomorrow. So I came back the next day, we cut the vocals in like maybe an hour and a half. He's, you know, he's very fast on a 58 in the back of the room, speakers blasting. And all right, well, it's two o'clock. Why don't you want to start another one? I'm like, okay, good. Started going through the records, found something, got a, something going. And then it just kept going like that. And then it, it just became kind of a, a bigger thing. And then I ended up moving down to LA and, and that's, that's where my involvement with Midnight Vultures. Um, that's how that began. And that was basically, um, you know, it was around then where I was like, I'm going to move into this type of stuff. You know, it's really fun for me. Um, I'm good at it. So I enjoyed doing that sort of work. So I, when I moved to LA, I, I actually, I wanted to do more production and mixing and, and recording. Um, so I, but I moved into a studio in a sound design house, a, a commercial house, basically, where they make commercials. And I was going to be, I was able to work on my own stuff, my own music projects. But I also needed, I also had to be available to do sound design for their commercials that came in. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of holding on to that a little bit to just make sure I had income coming in. You were trying to make sure you didn't let go of one before you were firmly on the other. Yeah. Um, cause I didn't really know, you know, it's like, what if I didn't get any other projects? Yeah. What if you make this one record cause Beck likes you, but no one else does. And you yeah. always catastrophize like that, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, I kept the sound design thing going and then I just started getting really busy with, with the, with the, the production and the mixing. And then I just, I, I let it go. And, um, but still, you know, to this day, I, there's so many things I've done where I'm putting in sound effects, you know, in, in parts of songs that whether they're for an atmosphere or it's something that's funny, you know, putting in like a horse whinny in the middle of like in the middle of a bridge somewhere in a, in a funny spot. That's just like, like, what the hell was that? You know? Mm. But, um, but I love that, you know, it kind of, it's just, drama you know it's making making things more fun more interesting to listen to yeah i remember i mean um uh, when eminem first started coming out and i just took it uh for granted because i was i was six when the slim shady lp came out i think and i just took it for granted that well, i mean dr dre shoved a load of sound effects in the production and i thought that's just what producers do but that really makes that thing stand out it's like it's like it's like mtv in the front cartoon network in the back and so you as a sound designer knew the what the sort of transient importance of just having those little moments of punctuation and we're able you put that in your records as well yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially the intros of songs often I'll have something in there to to just set it up, set up what's about to come, set a mood, set an atmosphere. Mm. Um, I, I've done that quite a bit. I love doing that, finding the right sound or the right atmosphere. Um, it can kind of bring you there right from that first note. It's, it's cool. Yeah. And so, so Beck... And, you know, a bit of a stroke of luck there. Um, and, you know, having the talent in the first place, you were able to make this jump from the professional world into the, not the non-professional world, but the one that's more risky to be involved in because it's not like, you know, you, as a producer, as someone who's making records, you're never like a salaried employee. You know, you never have that kind of protection. And so yeah. how, how did you start? How did you continue that to develop a portfolio and a career from doing the first record? very simply by doing right doing a lot and um and learning you know doing so that so that i could learn i could get the mistakes out of the way learning how to work with other people deal with all situations that could possibly come up with artists labels managers whatever um but yeah by doing there, there is no school 
one could go to to learn what I was learning back then. You know, yeah, it doesn't it's impossible. It doesn't exist. And um, you can learn the technical stuff, but at some point you actually have to do like you've got to ap- apply that and you know have like practical experience using the, the tools and the the concepts. Um, and sometimes making your own, sometimes knowing the right way to record something and well, let's do it the wrong way. What is that? What is that like? Yeah. Everyone's doing it this way. And that's kind of how I've always been. Everyone's doing this like, well, why am I going to do that? Let's go over here and do that. And that's kind of, um, I think that's just how I'm wired. You know, if the pack is going there, I'm, I'm always like going over there for better or for worse, you know? And, um, you know, I think with, with, with production and, and mixing and recording, that's probably helped me to some degree. Cause I, I don't, I'm, I'm aware. I'd like to be, you know, I'm always listening to music and, you know, current music, older music. So I'm, I'm always, I like to be aware of what's happening, mm-hmm. um, musically, but I don't chase trends. I assume that things are going to be, if, if we're working on something today, it's going to come out and maybe, four or five, six months, whatever, um, whatever. So to make it sound like today, we'll date it immediately. Exactly. Yeah. No one's going to be interested in that thing. So, um, that's why it's, it's important to have a a sonic, a unique sonic identity, Mm. you know, to not sound like the thing that is, or, you know, not sound like other things that are already out, but to sound like something that stands on its own. Yeah. And they're always, I get the sense there's always there always has to be a part of that brew that's that is new and is unique because the thing that hobbled the band I was in when I was in my early twenties was that we were trying to revive things that had already happened, and you know we were also kind of like everyone siloed in our own little bubble we didn't really engage with culture and so um it's easy also to assume that you're the only person, you're the only person who knows about the influence that you know about. So we, we, this was 2015 and, you know, everyone's listening to stuff like other records that you've worked on, like Foster the People and things like that. And we were like, ah, we're going to sound like, you know, Nirvana and the Pixies and no one will be expecting that. And then you realize, ah, you're actually just drinking from the same well everyone else has been drinking from. You need to find something that's like that, but that is also the new thing. We, you talked about that with the kooks. You've got all these influences, but there needs to be a part of it, which is you pulling them together and making the new thing out of it. The twist. Yeah. The shtick right. the <laughs> has to be the, yeah, there's gotta be something, you know, um, there's gotta be something tweaked about it. Yeah. Um, the, I don't want to disrupt that flow, but I was just thinking about foster the people. Cause we mentioned that. And obviously they had one of the biggest and one of the catchiest and one of the best songs of the last decade. And you were working on the album torches. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. you did you touch that single Pumped Up Kicks? Because there's yeah. a sort of legend that uh, I, I forget the singer's name. I think it's Mark um, recorded recorded it by himself in his project studio. Is is that the case, or did you were you involved in that? So he he made so some demos came over to me. That was one of the demos that came over, Pumped Up Kicks, and um, you know all the songs sounded really good. But that one in particular, I mean, it, I was like, that this, to me, this sounded like a single. It's an evergreen. Yeah. Now, no one knows like a big single, little single, but it definitely sounded like a single. It sounded like this was a very special song. It was mm-hmm. so catchy. And um, I'm pretty sure it was that version of it. And they did try recording it at you know one, maybe two times. Um, re-recording it, a proper recording, you know, because it was going to be, I think everyone agreed, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a single. So, the, you know, you do the thing. You go in into the studio and you get whatever. So, um, but ultimately, I think in the end, I didn't hear the other versions, but I think ultimately in the end, that version, there was just something really charming and whatever is right or wrong, you know, there's definitely a lot of right things about it. I, I guess you could say, there's a, there's, you know, you could put on like the A and R hat and say, well, there's a lot of wrong things about it because it doesn't sound like 
other things that are on the radio. It doesn't have the low end or doesn't have the same sonic profile that other songs uh, that this would be sitting next to. I And I'm like, maybe that's good. Yes. Maybe then you can differentiate from that other stuff. So whatever, I, you know, that could have been what the thought price process was, um, with the A&R team, but, but yeah, that's a very special song. And, and I'm 99% sure that's the Mark's original demo. He's really talented. He actually came from a post-production background as well, you know, doing like, um, composing for commercials and that yeah. sort of thing. And, you know, and you, and you can hear it in his songwriting. He, he knows just with hooks, you got to get stuff happening early on. You know, you got to, you don't have a lot of time basically to say what you're going to say. So yep. um, you got to like get intrigued people in the intro or in that first verse. Well, especially because, you know, Pumped Up Kicks, even on the, on the album version, you've basically got, I'm going to embarrass myself and the rest of the world now by doing the kind of that, because the drums, they, I know what you mean. The sonic profile doesn't sound like 2011 indie because those drum samples at the beginning are just so weird, boxy and modulated. You've got that. Then there's the hook. So you've got like five seconds before the song announces itself. Like you were saying, it's really, really tight. Yeah. So, um, and so, yeah, you can, you can tell, you can often tell when people are from the world where you need to get attention quickly. And of course, when I, when I joined this business in 2016, I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. The foster, the people guy came from advertising. So I'll probably do my pumped up kicks in, uh, you know, the next couple of years as well. But, um, but, uh, that's, so you were saying, you know, that is one of those records that came in and it's like, yeah, we tried to mess about with it, but you just can't, we can't necessarily improve on it. Yeah. Sometimes it's not the, the Sonics, you know, it, it's not about having a, a really good recording, a really pristine recording. Um, sometimes it's about, I mean, there's a lot of productions I've done where, you know, productions and mix and mixes for sure. Lots of mixes where we're trying to, um, it's, it's more about a feeling and not so much about having the most pristine low end. You know, it's about having things maybe sound a little reckless and not have the perfect balance. It's about having something that sounds exciting. Sometimes the perfect balance isn't going to get you that. There's been so many mixes that I've done where I'll have everything sounding good and then I'll just listen back to it and it's just not jumping out of the speakers. So I'll start pushing things up, you know, maybe four or five dB, like some very, make some just drastic big brush stroke moves and then things you know just do some wrong stuff just try some things out and then it starts to like there we go now it's sounding um a little crazy and a little irreverent and you know and if that's what's right for the song and for the artist and the that presentation then then great you know but um i'm not i'm not a big fan i'm not a very conservative um producer or mixer i'm always just trying to find a, like something to kind of mess up and, you know. Some way to push things over the top. Yeah, I, I just think you have to. Yeah. That's the music that I like, the, the music that I came up with uh, and still like to this day, like that, that's what attracts me to, to songs. It's, there's something that's just a bit unusual about it, you know. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's, that's I, used, I remember when I first heard that, uh, and again, that, it was another Albiniism. You can probably tell that Albini was my first kind of production idol when I, back when I was like 22. And he said um, something like, "If I, you know, music that sounds like you made it because you had to make it, and it doesn't just come from some genre, is always going to be more interesting." And I was like, "That can't be true. There's so much genre music out there." But then when you think about the great records, there's just there's something a bit that's a bit out of the mainframe about it. Like, um, you know, my, when I was 14, my number one artist in the world my favorite was uh, uh, elton john believe it or not and um you know you're like this guy looks like a bus driver from you know reading and he sings in a kind of twangy mick jagger like fake american accent and like plays you know um what it, yeah emotional singer songwriter piano in the age of guitar and it's like none of that should have worked but now it's like well that was the biggest pop star of all time because those things plus great songs equals magic and what a voice. What a voice. 
you know. soaring tenor. People don't really credit Elton John for his voice, but it's when before he became what he is now, the gruff kind of low thing, it was quite spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, what a Mad boy. Man Across the Water. What's that? Mad Man Across the Water. That album is full of yeah. great performances. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he definitely, you know, and just thinking back, he he definitely stood out on his own, you know, as an artist, as a singer, as a piano player, um, and a, just as a character, you know, he definitely had, he was in his own little area. He was very different than whatever else was happening at the time. And, and I think that's what artists have to do, you know, and I think kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier about social media and um, signing to a major label or, you know, that, that conversation it's just to my point, like you have to somehow artists have to somehow find something that's unique and, and, you know, about themselves and, and expand on that and build something around that. Like that's, that's what people are going to come to them for. Well, if I've learned nothing else from my time in podcasting, it's that when the circle kind of completes itself and you go back to where you started, that's usually a good jumping off point. And so um, I'm uh, I'm visiting the States later this year, Tony, but I'm not visiting Austin to my shame. I'm going to New York like a typical Brit who doesn't go to America very much. So uh, if you're in New York first week of September, I'll see you there. But uh, what's the rest of the year looking like for you at the moment? Have you got a few albums coming up? Have you got a few projects on? Yeah, there's um, finishing a bunch of things. I've got a few things um, coming up over the next few months. Um, I'll be, I don't know if I'm going to be in New York. I'll be in LA. Are you, are you making your way out to LA? Oh, I could do, leave it with me. I'll have to think about it. Okay. Give me a shout. If you, if you make it out to LA, um, hit me up. Let me know. I might, I might be there. I'm going to be there, um, for a few, for several weeks starting next week. Um, and then I'll, I'll likely be back later in the year. Need to go to New York, though. It's been a minute. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're currently... Austin is the current Thrive. It's the emerging creative capital of the States. So. Yeah. You should... You should. If you can, you should check it out. If you're able to come out for a couple of days, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm meaning to get there. And with any luck, uh, the, the visits will be more frequent. Uh, from now on so um but that's 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 all about me this has been having a guest with tony hoffer and it, you know you've been very generous with your time and also very relaxed and not saying like well done for being relaxed but you know a lot of people come onto a podcast like ready for a press release this has been a really good just conversation and we found out some great stuff about the the music of our youth culture are being millennials i was at caroline polachek last night at the albert hall who we, we spoke about on the on the call last time and you know um i can start to see the my youth culture starting to ossify as and you, you know as it does once the time is over, you then can put it in its box and see what it was. And, you know, you've contributed to that culture a great deal with records like by artists like Kooks, Foster the People and M83. So thanks for everything you've done for us, for us millennials, uh, Tony, and uh, for everything you're still doing for the music scene. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to work on, I'm just trying to do some cool stuff, you know, to, it's not, it's, it's, it's not anything that, uh, it's trying to make cool music, you know what I mean? Just like everybody yeah. else. So yeah, yeah my, my pleasure. All right, let's do this again sometime. All right, appreciate it.